Hello, everyone. I'm Gloria Greer. As a journalist for over 35 years, I have interviewed some of the most important and entertaining people of our time. So please join us as we sit back and enjoy classic conversations. <laughs> From 1961 to 1982, Walter Cronkite, seen here conducting the 29 Palms Marine Band recently at the Palm Springs Air Museum, anchored the CBS Nightly News. Time Magazine called him the single most convincing and authoritative figure in news, while News and World Report listed him among the 10 most influential news decision makers in the world. I will have a conversation with Walter Cronkite. There is no doubt that the dean of all American journalists is Walter Cronkite. In 1973, a poll was taken and Walter Cronkite was named the most trusted man in America. It is a great pleasure to be having a conversation with Walter Cronkite. How do you feel about television today? Uh, the television has no reason to hang its head uh, as to the talents and the abilities uh, of the journalists who are uh, manning the three major networks today, the old traditional networks, NBC, CBS, ABC. Those anchor people, their correspondents, are all excellent journalists. Their problem today is not what they can do, but what they're permitted to do by management. Uh, management today is now part of a great megapolis of, uh, of businesses, uh, entertainment business and a lot of other things. Uh, as a consequence, the managers of those businesses don't have the same feeling about news that the old owners of the networks had, who came to it originally, founded the networks, and learned their, uh, their news responsibilities to the public at the feet of Congress as they made the FCC laws, the Federal Communication Laws. They were there at the beginning. So they gave us our heads. We, we did what we felt was necessary to deliver to the American public the, the, the amount of news, the type of news that the public needed. Today, they're not given that opportunity. Today, the networks have suffered a considerable loss in viewership because the cable uh, exposure, uh, the internet itself, uh, and uh, local stations that now have the satellite to work with, all of that is a competition. So they now have an audience that is only about half what it was in my day when, we, when the three of us split the entire audience. Today they're splitting an audience which is much less and uh, their ratings are much less. So the managers looking back in those days managers who were too young to be around in those days, say, we want ratings like they, like they had in the old days, where they're never going to have them again. Mm. So they're also saying, why don't you liven up your broadcast? They're telling them to do these feature stories, which don't belong on an evening news broadcast. They're, you know, your bank book and mine, your, uh, your uh, kitchen and mine, your diet and mine, your health and mine. Those are good programs, good features, but they belong somewhere else, not in the evening news. The evening news is, we only have 63, 64 minutes, something like that in the evening news after you subtract the commercials and, and the lead-ins and lead-outs. That's not enough time to cover a complicated world like we have, a complicated country like we've got. Even when I was doing it, we weren't adequate to what the public really needed to know. I used to tell people at that time, I said, those people are depending solely on television news, are not getting enough information to adequately exercise their franchise at the polls, meaning that we've got a democracy that's sinking in intelligence level to operate this country. It's a dangerous situation, and the networks are not letting their news people do what they ought to be doing at this time. It's a, it is frightening, really, it is. Now, another thing is in losing revenue, and I think I heard you say this. You were just recently at the Air Museum, but a year ago uh, you spoke at the Temple. And that is about the networks closing their bureaus. 
Oh, We're terrible. so used to seeing CNN and, and the cables who, who are all over the world that yeah. until you said it, I was not aware that the networks don't no, have the you bureaus. Have, look at the networks and they're not even covering foreign news unless it's a major disaster. And then they parachute in, as we say, a correspondent and a film crew. Uh, well, that's all right for a disaster, they can cover it, but covering a heavy, dip, difficult, diplomatic, uh, political story, they can't do it parachuting in because their correspondent they send in at this last minute doesn't have the, uh, the, con the contacts to cover that story as well it needs to be covered. So they don't cover it at all. They just report what the uh, press services, the AP, Reuters, Agence France Press, tell them. It isn't often that a journalist makes the news, he reports the news. And yet you, Walter Cronkite, actually was um, indirectly responsible for the start of the Middle East peace process. Well, right after uh, Anwar Sadat became the president of Egypt, I uh, did an interview with him. And uh, uh, I sat under the spreading banyan tree in the, on the banks of the Nile, his uh, uh, country president's house. And uh, he went through a very long recital of the things he hoped to do with Egypt. And quite honestly, having just flown in from the States, being a little sleepy, I was hard put to stay awake during all of it. But at one moment, he startled me awake with a statement that I thought I heard him say, and I shall go to Jerusalem. Well, for goodness sakes, that was a scoop for heaven's sake. He was telling me that he was going to Jerusalem with Israel, of course, which was still a, at war with Egypt. And uh, I, I, you say you're going to, you, <laughs> yes, 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 Walter, I, I shall go to Jerusalem. Well, it turned out he meant that it was it simply meant that in his lifetime, sometime, there would be peace so that he, indeed, even he, Sadat, would be able to go to Jerusalem. Now then, he made this statement to a bunch of Canadian parliamentarians who were visiting his parliament. And he was talking to parliament, talked to them directly, but they heard him say again in this speech, and I shall go to Israel, which he said frequently. They left before they could ask him about it, to fly indeed to Israel. And there immediately, as soon as they saw uh, Prime Minister Begin, uh, they, uh, he, they said, he said he's coming to Israel. <laughs> He can said, I don't know anything about that. But that spread the rumor around in Israel. So Monday morning, our smart producer got him on the satellite, and I said to Mr. Sadat, uh, what is this story? And uh, he said, uh, well, uh, that indeed, Walter, I shall go to Israel. And I said, uh, well, uh, what are your conditions before you go to Jerusalem? Expecting him to say what he'd always said, and he did indeed say, well, well, peace will depend on their leaving the Sinai and leaving the Golan Heights. They've got to get back these things. And I said, and those are your conditions before you would go. And he said, oh, no, 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 Walter. Those are the conditions for peace. I could go any time. Well, being, I think, a pretty good journalist, I've got to pin that one down. I said, well, could, this was a Monday morning. Could you go this week? He said, yes, indeed, Walter. I could go this week. So my, immediately we got on the satellite to Begin and told Begin that he said he could come this week. Begin looked like I'd struck him with a, in the solar plexus with a pile driver. And he, uh, but he came to and he said, well, 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 well. tell him he can come, tell him he can come. Easy. And anyway, it resulted in his going to Israel that week. Amazing story, really wonderful story. Yeah. And it started all now. Of course, the story goes on because you're, you're situation uh, on arriving there is a funny one, but I'm, I'm going to ask you to the present, and as we are taping this, we'll let our viewers in on, the election is taking place in Israel, but it will be over by then. Do you think that we will ever, in our lifetime, see peace in, in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem, and with the Arabs and Israel? Well, ever is a very long time, of course. Uh, I would certainly hope that sometime in the future, yeah. in the immediate future, I can't see any bright light at all. Uh, they came very close, very close with the U.S.-sponsored talks uh, with Barack in power. But now with Sharon in power, uh, there's a, I don't see I'm, uh, any possibility in the near future. And of course, uh, with the violence that occurred, uh, which indeed Sharon himself helped inspire by his visit to the temple, uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that has closed the door almost completely for the moment. 
Uh, I would hope that people will come to their senses again in the near future and that again uh, peace talks can reopen and that indeed we can have peace in the Middle East. It's such a shame that uh, the, the wonderful country of Israel and the wonderful people of Israel and the Palestine. The Palestinians are nice people if you get to know them. Uh, I'm suggesting there's a lot of problems. There are the militant Palestinians as there are the militant Israelis who cause a lot of the trouble. But they should be in peace. They should be living in peace. And we've got to hope that someday that happens. I interviewed recently Ehud Omet, who is the mayor of Jerusalem. And he feels that if they're actually the Palestinians who have been living in Jerusalem, if it came right down to it, that they would almost rather have the Israelis in charge. And these well, I, I, think, I think there's some reason to believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, mostly because the Israelis uh, have created uh, this uh, very successful society, cultural and economic, particularly economic society, uh, and uh, the Palestinians are still refugees. They're living in a country that, that, that is not their own. They have, they have got an area of, uh, of, of Jordan that was ceded to them as a home country, but they, it's, it's nothing that, uh, that they have been able to organize themselves. They have no financing to organize it. There's no certainty that this land will remain theirs. Uh, they, uh, so obviously, they'd rather live in Israel. Yeah. I, I don't doubt that. Yeah, and apparently, I know when I visited there, and I'm sure you have many, many, many times, they seem to live, you go in the old city, and they seem to be quite peaceful Well, together. as you know, one of the, one of the fa reasons that the peace talks broke down was that the Palestinians insist on the right as refugees to go into Israel. So they still want to go to Israel, even with their own country, they should have that right. Yeah. And the, the, the Israelis said they couldn't grant them that right. Yeah. So this was one of the reasons that broke down. Of course they want to, an opportunity to move around and in the most economically successful country in the Middle East. I want to change the subject totally, because you have a book out, and oh, it's, indeed yes. Let's show it. That's right. <laughs> Walter That's Cronkite. what you do on talk shows, you yeah, know. Yeah, a journalist. But, it's <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, tell me about your book. The coverage well, of your whole career? Uh, it's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's the principal thing you need to know about the book. It's a story of my life. It's a bio, an autobiographical story of a reporter's life, as it's called. Was it, difficult? Life. Was it difficult to, I mean, with the many experiences that you've had to, to, Get them all determine one book. what you're going to put in that book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was difficult. As a matter of fact, the publisher knocked five chapters out of oh. the book. But uh, I may have to put in a sequel any day now. Well, we'll look forward to that. I hope you do. In your illustrious long career, what would be the most exciting moment when you were on television? Well, or? you're asking an individual who was uh, of the age group to have been in World War II as a war correspondent, which wasn't a bad way to be in a war. Uh, the, uh, uh, and I had the opportunity to, to uh, witness almost as all aspects of the military effort. The Air Force I covered during the days when that was the main story in, in Western Europe before we landed in, on D-Day. I uh, made uh, the uh, first trip on which they permitted correspondents to fly into Germany with the Flying Fortresses. And that we had uh, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, as our, as our companions for two and a half hours on that raid and we lost several air quite a lot of 16 out of 60 aircraft were lost and uh, including one of the correspondents who went Bob Post to the New York uh, Times and uh, we got shot up pretty well so that was an experience the uh, I landed with the 101st Airborne as you suggested in, uh, in the Netherlands for that operation I was there for the Battle of the Bulge and I uh, so I saw the infantry in action, saw the Navy in action. My, my first assignment right after Pearl Harbor was as one of the first correspondent to, uh, credited to the Navy. And I went uh, out on the Battle of the Atlantic as the German submarines were playing hob with our convoys. So I had, I had a wild, wide experience in the war. So you're asking about most interesting experiences. Well, <laughs> obviously, yeah. those were the ones. But if you want to know about the television mm -hmm. years, uh, I, I'd have to say that uh, I think that uh, for personal experience, mine was uh, was being uh, 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 covering the first convention that was covered, 
first political conventions that were they were covered in '48, but there were only how three they changed. changed. Uh, how they oh, changed. Oh, how we've changed. Yeah. Yeah. But that was very exciting for a young reporter to be there covering the, the for the television for the first time, and the elections thereafter, and then uh, later on covering space, the, uh, the man's landing on the moon, probably the greatest story of the 20th century. Many wonderful, wonderful experiences. There's a school of journalism named after you in Arizona. Uh, Arizona State University. That must be a great pride I to you. I don't know what I did to deserve it, but I, oh. I appreciate it. <laughs> Set a standard. A now, standard. I went to the University of Texas, of course, and yeah. there the, there's an Annenberg Award in my mm -hmm. name uh, for journalism, which I appreciate. Yeah. Well, you know, you, of course, were, are, are here uh, for an event that took place recently, and that was at the Palm Springs Air Museum, where you were a guest. You got to lead a military band, and that's something you'd always wanted to do. <laughs> well, every red-blooded American boy wants to lead a military band, and I use my, the power of, uh, of whether I accept an engagement or not, if the band's playing, I say, well, if you can arrange for me to lead the band in just one number, just, just so I have a fun of doing it, not that it's going to entertain anybody, but that I'm going to do it, get to lead a band, I, uh, I use that little, little bit of blackmail <laughs> to, to, to uh, accept an engagement. And here, I'm glad to say that, uh, that uh, the sponsors of the event arranged for the Marine Band to let me lead a number, Stars and Stripes Forever, which is a, a favorite. I've led the actual, the, the, the number one U.S. Marine Band in Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, I, I think I'm the only civilian who's ever led that band in its 100-year history. I've uh, led the U.S. Army Band in a couple of concerts, and, uh, uh, but always with a simple march. <laughs> I, 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 I don't pretend to be a conductor except in my ambitions, not in my talent. Well, I, I, I played an instrument in a band in high school, and that's all I know of music. I couldn't read a full orchestration if I, if I, if my life depended on it. But I do know that the stars and stripes forever go da 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 da. You know, anybody can do it. Well, everybody applauded with you when you were swinging away, and they were standing and cheering and clapping, and it really was, you know, sensational. Well, and you also, you love to sail, don't you? Oh, I'm a, I'm an avid sailor. I don't claim to be a great sailor, but an avid one. I, I love the uh, the experience of sailing. And, uh, and we do a lot of it in the family. Mm -hmm. We've had a boat for years, and, and as my wife say, say, is, uh, says, doesn't anybody ever buy a smaller boat? <laughs> of course not. We've moved up from 11 feet to 60 feet uh, boat. And where do you have the boat? Uh, we have a home in Martha's Vineyard, mm -hmm. uh, the island off the Massachusetts coast, a lovely resort island. And, uh, and we are there for four months a year. And then we take the boat down to the Caribbean in the winter. Yeah. You have, I believe, three children, grown children, right? I have, we have three children yeah. and uh, four grandchildren. And your wife was a journalist. Indeed she was. In fact, she was the last woman's editor of the Kansas City Journal before it folded. <laughs> so uh, when it folded, well, that um, left our marriage even more intact than it was before, probably. Now, you have been doing specials on PBS. And are you continuing to do them now? Uh, occasional specials yeah. come along that we do. We're talking about a couple right now. Right. And, and I do uh, other documentaries for mm -hmm. other sources, right. particularly the Discovery Channel. Mm -hmm. I do things for them. You told me a wonderful story about the chimps or oh, yes, whatever right. it was. Uh, <laughs> you might well, the, oh, the, we were doing a, we were doing a documentary on chimpanzees in, uh, yeah. in Africa, and I was doing a, the opening piece with these little baby chimps, the cutest things in the world. And they were they were jumping in and out of my arms as I did the opening, and uh, I said that the chimpanzee was closest to us in the evolutionary tree of any other animal, and uh, they were so much like us in so many ways, and and in many ways it seemed even seemed that they loved us, and when I said loved us, this one chimp who was in my arm at the moment sat back and looked at me, you know. Like, what did he say? Wham! And hit me over the face, <laughs> almost took my head off. So the producers all laughed, and they said, oh, let's try it again, Walter, once more. So we got the chimps back and uh, make the same statement. At the same chimp takes another look and love you, and wham! And he obviously understood English, and he was having none of that, that they loved us. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you're going back to 
Martha's where? <laughs> to your home, or you have more lectures to do? Oh, oh uh, we're, I'm going from here to Houston for mm -hmm. an appearance at, a, at their uh, opera, the Houston yeah. Opera. And uh, not singing. Nope. <laughs> not singing. <laughs> and and not nobody, leading. Nobody would ever book that. Not leading the uh, orchestra. Huh? And not leading the orchestra. No, no, no I'm afraid they're going to let me read you. I couldn't lead. Because that orchestra doesn't know Stars and Stripes forever, you see. <laughs> right. You can handle Aida, but not that. You have played such an important part in everything, it seems, that happened in the 20th century, or a great deal of it. And now we are in the 21st century. And where do you think? What do you think the exciting things are going to be that we can look forward oh, to? I have no idea. Uh, that looking in that crystal ball is madness. Uh, who would have in 1950 dreamed of the things we have today in this century, in that century, until the last one just passed? Uh, the the, the, the uh, technical developments, scientific developments, are coming so rapidly that I couldn't predict what's going to be what we're going to have. Uh, in our computers two years from now, let alone what the world is going to look like politically or any other way. You were so uh, really amazed when we did finally land on the moon, and you really lost your reserve and said something like, wow, or gee whiz, or something. <laughs> well, it wasn't my reserve. I was just so, so overtaken yeah. that I couldn't, uh, I, I was speechless. Uh, I'd had just as long to prepare for the moon landing as NASA had. I'd been covering, covering rocketry for that length of time and the developments at NASA. And, uh, and uh, Wally Shiraw, the astronaut who lives over here in San Diego, uh, he, uh, uh, he uh, uh, said to me, he was at the desk with me as our technical expert, and he said, what are you going to say when they land? What are you going to say, Walter? Oh, I'd like to know what you're going to say so I can think of some things to say. And I said, I don't have the slightest idea. I never write these things in advance for these kind of an event. But I'll, it'll come to me when, I, when it happens. Well, it's, all that could, came to me was, golly, gee, wow. You know? <laughs> Boy, profound statements at that yeah. moment. Well, you've made many profound statements. Yeah. And that is the way it was. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it was. <laughs> and uh, certainly you were a part of all of our lives for so long. And oh, as you. I said, you are the standard bearer that I don't think too many journalists can come close to well, at all. But I thank you so much for sharing time well, with me here. Well, thank you for having me and thank the people of uh, this wonderful valley for their hospitality and their, their loveliness. It's a great place. Thank you so much.